This aircraft is the most advanced of its breed. Built around a first look, first shot, first kill ethos, it is all set to become the air dominant stealth fighter of the 21st century. The Raptor is a killing machine, just like the name implies. As deadly as it looks, it's even more deadly when it gets out there and does its job. Deadly and undetectable at long range, this breathtaking fifth generation fighter blends unmatched dogfighting with precision strike ground attack capabilities. You literally are able to swim through the sharks and the sharks never see you and never know you're there. And at any point in time, you can reach out and touch them with deadly force. Capable of super crews and packing a deadly array of state-of-the-art missile systems, this stealth jet of the new millennium can intercept and strike any target with near impunity. They die. They die without knowing where the Raptors are. They die without knowing that they were targeted. They die wholesale. Now, using unique footage, we'll take you on an all-access tour of America's newest superweapon, the F.A. 22 Raptor. Nineteen eighty-one. In his first press conference as chief executive of the United States, Ronald Wilson Reagan offered a deal to the Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. If Soviet SS-20 missiles aimed at Western Europe were removed, America would not deploy its Pershing II cruise missiles to counter the threat. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets developed different missiles to attack in different altitude bands. You couldn't fly under the missile threat. You couldn't fly over the missile threat. You had to deal with the missile threat. One way to do that is to make suppression of enemy air defense, that is destroying the missile sites and the radars, the most important mission for the Air Force. By the 1970s, air superiority had re-emerged as a top priority and the U.S. Air Force committed to building its first pure air superiority fighter, an aircraft that would eventually become the F-15 Eagle. But just as F-15s became operational in 1978, alarming new evidence suggested that the new fighter's superiority might only be temporary. U.S. reconnaissance satellites passing over a Soviet flight test center north of Moscow discover new Soviet fighters being tested. One was the agile fighter, the Mikoyan MiG-29. But the other came as a huge shock to Western analysts. It was bigger than the F-15 and far bigger than any previous Soviet-built fighter, the Sukhoi T-10 prototype. At that time, the Soviet Union initiated some very aggressive programs to come up with counters. And both the Mikoyan and Sukhoi, uh, both those design bureaus, uh, initiated new aircraft development efforts. And it appeared that they were on a track that would field some very advanced fighters. If the MiG-29 had concerned the American military establishment, the existence of the Sukhoi T-10 set alarm bells ringing. These are very good aircraft. They're aircraft that play in the same league as some of the top NATO aircraft, like Phantom, and ultimately like F-15. The goal is world peace. That must be Just weeks into his first term, America's 40th president increased U.S. defense spending by $32.5 billion and began the rearmament of the United States on a colossal scale. In 1981, the Cold War was getting very warm. As Reagan and Brezhnev squared up, the U.S. Air Force concluded that it urgently needed a replacement for its F-15, an advanced tactical fighter, or ATF, that would have no equal. As American planners start to develop the concept of air land battle to fight World War III, the U.S. Air Force starts to think about the kind of equipment it wants to have when it comes time to fight the war. At that time, in the secretive black world of advanced aviation development, 
One technology had emerged at the forefront of all military aircraft development, stealth. During that period, the late 1970s, of course, in what we call the black world, in the, uh, in the world of secret programs, there was a great effort going on to come up with counters to these new uh, Soviet weapon systems that could enable us to get, knock out their uh, SAM system. And that, of course, uh, led to the development of the F-117. Analysis of air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam, called the Red Baron Study, had kick-started the race for stealth. An operational analysis study showed that in Vietnam that most aircraft were killed by other aircraft that they hadn't seen. So from this you get the idea that if the aircraft isn't seen, it has a tremendous advantage. Air combat data from World War II and Korea had reinforced this need for invisibility. So from this, in a process of operational analysis, the U.S. Air Force learns that what you really need to do is be invisible to the enemy. And that means that an aircraft is designed to be as near as possible invisible to an enemy fighter aircraft. Its geometry is designed to give it a very low profile, that is to make it very invisible, to an oncoming fighter aircraft using high-frequency fighter aircraft radar. The principle of stealth technology is to literally make an aeroplane invisible to the enemy. An aircraft's shape must reflect incoming radio waves away from the enemy radar, rather than towards it. To further increase low observable characteristics, an aeroplane is then covered in materials that absorb radar signals, further reducing its visibility on a radar screen. Stealth doesn't mean invisible. It just means less visible. Operational analysis shows that if you apply certain computer models to air-to-air -to -air combat, the more stealthy aircraft, the one that's harder to see, is likelier to win. Leading the way in stealth technology was Lockheed Skunk Works. In the late 1970s, stealth wasn't widely known outside of a, a few companies. The ability to integrate stealth technology, shaping for stealth and the materials, was really only well known in two companies. It was Lockheed and Northrop. In 1977, amid unprecedented security, Lockheed had flown a prototype of the world's first stealth fighter. And by the 1980s, during Operation Just Cause, its F-117 had helped to destroy General Noriega's regime in Panama. Now, the U.S. Air Force decided that any new fighter must incorporate stealth technology and identified two other areas in which a future air superiority fighter should excel. Well, at that stage of the game, uh, it was clear that the Air Force wanted a stealthy fighter. It was also clear that they wanted uh, an airplane that would supercruise, in other words, run supersonically without lighting off the afterburners. And they didn't want to sacrifice any of the classic fighter maneuverability. So they wanted a fighter that, besides all the new technology, would maneuver as well or better than the F-15. In October 1982, representatives from fighter manufacturers met with the U.S. Air Force and began to identify the specific must-haves for the new fighter. At the time, there were uh, eight contractors that built combat aircraft in the States. Seven of those responded to our request for proposals from that period of 1983 to 85 or 86 was a, a process of refinement, it, you know, narrowing down the specific parameters. It must be a supersonic cruise aircraft with a combat radius of seven to 900 miles with reduced observables if possible. The aircraft would have to be able to operate on a 2,000 foot runway and must be easier to maintain than an F-15. The challenge had been issued now it was up to the finest aviation manufacturers in the world to respond. I'm a village optimist, and 
I have to say that the requirements were very demanding, but I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have any strong feeling that we couldn't do this. The advanced tactical fighter program was about to begin, and the Raptor, America's fifth generation fighter, was about to be hatched. By 1983, U.S.-Soviet relations had reached a new low. Following Leonid Brezhnev's death, the Politburo, now controlled by ex-KGB boss Yuri Andropov, had been labeled by Reagan as the focus of evil in the modern world. Continuing his policy of rearmament, Reagan announced plans for the Strategic Defense Initiative, better known as Star Wars. And Moscow reacted furiously. Попытки Вашингтона оправдать эти наращивания, которые американцы якобы должны наверстывать, это и мыслители. That August, when Korean Airlines flight 007 on its way to Seoul from New York strayed several hundred miles off course into Soviet airspace, Russia acted. A fighter was sent up, and the civilian airliner with 269 people on board was shot down. The shooting down of KAL-007 sent shockwaves around the world, straining international relations almost to breaking point. What can we think of a regime that so broadly trumpets its vision of peace and global disarmament and yet so callously and quickly commits a terrorist act to sacrifice the lives of innocent human beings. Reagan's reaction to the crisis strengthened U.S. conviction that stealth would now be the prime requirement for America's new fighter. Some senior people in the Pentagon looked at the stealth requirements and decided they were inadequate and they radically changed them. So stealth became a really major dominant requirement in the program. In this politically charged climate, the U.S. Air Force created its Advanced Tactical Fighter, or ATF, System Program Office. Based at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, Colonel Albert C. Picarillo is placed in charge of the division. One of the things we really wanted was the ability to leverage stealth in a high-performance fighter. And we also wanted this high-performance fighter to still be capable of good, close-in, within visual range maneuvering capability. In fact, we wanted more than just existing capability in some areas. The manufacturers are invited to submit concepts for an aircraft with an operational radius of 800 miles, enough to allow it to operate over the entire central region of Europe from bases in central England. It should have low observable characteristics and be able to cruise at Mach 1.5 for an astonishing 600 miles. We weren't building an, an airplane for the 1990s, although that was what we were trying to do. We were really building a fighter for the 21st century that could take on uh, all of the advanced threats that the Soviet Union was likely to throw at us. All of the teams would have their work cut out for them, but importantly, the military added another complicating factor. At the end of the concept demonstration phase, the decision was made by the Air Force to launch a demonstration validation phase of the program that would involve building two flight demonstrators, YF-type airplanes, that would uh, then be evaluated. They didn't have to have full armament, they didn't have to have avionics, they didn't have to have stealth coatings, but essentially they were going to go out and show us what you can do. But building prototype aircraft is expensive, and no one manufacturer could afford it on their own. And they all know that they must invest so much money in developing that if they don't get the contract, they're going to be so out of pocket, it's going to hurt the company badly. We and Lockheed made a policy decision at the CEO level that we would seek teaming. So the bottom line is we ended up deciding that we would team 
with Boeing and General Dynamics Fort Worth. Each manufacturer would submit a design for the demonstration valuation, or DEMVAL, competition, but had agreed that the winning company would be the prime contractor and its partners subcontracted to produce major components. Everybody's investment will be at least partly repaid because everybody gets a piece of the action. Seven designs for the Air Force competition were submitted for final evaluation. All of the uh, seven contractors came in with designs that were very feasible and it could, that could have been built. The question was which were the best and, and then how did we determine that they really were good enough. Two manufacturers with strong experience in stealth technology, Northrop with its B-2 and Lockheed with its F-117 lead the way. Northrop's advanced tactical fighter, or ATF design, was for an alien-looking aircraft with diamond planform wings and huge V-tails. It was a design that stressed speed and stealth. Northrop came in with a, an airplane that really, from the very beginning, looked just like the YF-23 that eventually was built and flown. Lockheed's entry echoed that of the F-117. Its vectored thrust, arrowhead shape, trapezoidal wings and four tails ensured that the aircraft would be maneuverable. The fact was that Lockheed and Northrop had significant advantages in the fact that they had built stealth aircraft and flown them. It's a big credibility factor there. On October the 31st, 1986, both Lockheed and Northrop's ATF designs were declared the winners of the competition. Under the terms of the Dem Val competition, each team would build two aircraft. At the end of the process, one of two designs would become America's new advanced tactical fighter. Costing billions of dollars, the new fighter would make a technological leap into the 21st century. Just nine months after being selected to build two demonstration valuation fighters for the US Air Force, Lockheed shocked everyone and scrapped its original design. In July of 87, we looked at our design at that time and we looked at what we thought it would weigh and how it would perform. And with no input from the Air Force, we decided to start over. So between July 13th of 87 and mid-October that year, basically that's where the F-22 came into the world. In a hectic three-month process, with help from its partners, Lockheed produced a completely different configuration with a clipped delta wing. We changed to clipped diamond wings, which gave us almost the same aerodynamic performance, but a lot lower structural weight. We did the same thing with the trapezoidal horizontal tails and the same thing with the verticals. Over the next four years, at a cost of just over $2 billion, America's tactical fighter competition became the largest program of its kind. And in 1990, just months after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the shapes of the two rival designs were finally unveiled. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present to you the YF-22A prototype for U.S. air superiority in the 21st century. On behalf of the entire team, I am honored to present the YF-23. Northrop's version, called the YF-23, closely resembled its original design. Well, it was a most unusual looking aircraft, very futuristic. It had uh, uh, twin V-tails as opposed to what we call a cruciform, twin verticals and twin horizontals. Uh, it had a large trapezoidal wing um, and it had a very slender shape when looked at from the, uh, the edge on view. In contrast, Lockheed's design, called the YF-22, seemed surprisingly conventional, 
with four tail surfaces, vectored thrust, a broad solid body and a conventional wing. But unlike Lockheed's other stealth aircraft, the F-117, radar absorbent materials were not applied over the whole of the F-A-22, but used selectively on its edges, cavities and crucial surface areas. You walk around the airplane, everywhere you look, uh, what you see is uh, something that's designed to do the job in the most efficient and effective way, and no wasted space, no wasted uh, capability. Uh, it's truly an airplane that's intended and has been optimized for its job. The F-22 carries its weapons internally. Four weapons bays are hidden in the central mid-body section. Six missiles can be carried in the ventral bays, which are covered with bifold doors. The side bays will each hold one Sidewinder missile carried on a trapeze launcher. The mid-body section also houses the fighter's landing gear and complex inlet ducts. Right from day one on the F-22, we decided to put S-shaped inlet ducts on it. So the airplane is built with S-shaped inlet ducts so that there's no way a radar is ever seeing the forward face of the jet engine. Attached to the mid-body is the forebody, which accommodates the cockpit and advanced avionics. Both the YF-23 and the YF-22 are impressive looking machines but their performance still needs to be tested. The most crucial stage of the competition is still to come, the flight testing. Northrop was first in the air. In August 1990, flown by Paul Metz, the YF-23 got airborne. The test was a huge success. But Lockheed was quick to respond, and on September the 29th, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Lockheed Chief Test Pilot Dave Ferguson prepared the Raptor for its maiden flight. I pulled on the runway and looked down the runway. It was just a feeling of really relief and that we're going to do it. And I ran the airplane up to 80% uh, military power. And the acceleration was just amazing. I mean, it was like an F-15 in full afterburning. And I felt the only thing in this airplane that's ever flown before is me. And I, I think in the back of my mind, I was saying, please fly, please fly. And I pulled the nose up and, and it just lifted off. I was fully aware we had a, a wonderful flying airplane and uh, the uh, handling qualities in the takeoff and landing, or power approach as we call it, were just absolutely superb. When I landed and Sherm met me at the airplane, I, I said, hey boss, we really have a winner here. The way the F-22 performed was no surprise to anybody who was involved in the program, not at all. I mean, my money has been on the F-22 from early 1985, and it'll be there till I'm gone. Over the next three months, the Raptor underwent a whole series of tests. The Air Force required both teams to give them performance projections, and uh, then they were going to actually compare that with what the airplanes actually did in flight, subsonic, supersonic, at different altitudes, and so forth. The winner of this stage would earn a contract for 650 aircraft. 
The decision would hinge not just on what the contractors promised, but on the Air Force's confidence in their ability to deliver. We expected to get a lot of flying done in the 90 days. We actually got 72 flights out of two airplanes in 90 days. And that is about as good as you can do. During flight testing, the Raptor had beaten Northrop's YF-23 in a number of crucial performance areas. We'd focused on the supersonic testing, including supercruising, and we did something that Northrop didn't do, and that is we did launch a couple of missiles. We launched a sidewinder out of the internal side bay on our prototype airplanes, and we launched an AMRAAM long-range air-to-air missile out of the internal weapon base. The YF-22 had clearly shown that in every category, it was far superior to any existing fighter. The Air Force was, was very impressed by what Lockheed had done. Their flight test program was very aggressive. They flew uh, hard and fast. They flew many more hours and sorties than Northrop did. And all of that gave the Air Force confidence that they knew what they were doing, high confidence, and they could build a superior airplane. But it would be events in 1991 that would carve out the Raptor's future. Twenty-two minutes after midnight on January the 17th, 1991, Lockheed Stealth F-117 spearheaded U.S. strikes against Saddam Hussein's regime. The performance of Lockheed Stealth bombers during Operation Desert Storm would give the company and its aircraft some priceless publicity. I think, uh, clearly, Lockheed was benefited in 1991 by the Gulf War, where the F-117 was, was a star performer. And uh, there were skeptics of stealth, even as late as that. That had to be beneficial to the program. But another aircraft also emerged from the Gulf War with a glowing reputation. The F-15, the aircraft destined to be replaced by the ATF, had emphatically confirmed its status as the foremost air superiority fighter in the world. Now it appeared that the need for an advanced stealthy fighter, the F-22, might be totally unfounded. See, it's not like the F-15 wasn't any good. It's a good aircraft. It's still a good aircraft. It will be a good aircraft for years to come. You could even just tool up the factory and keep building new F-15s. Why not? Hey, I'm gonna bring him up now. But not everyone agrees. The big weakness in their argument is they are making a statement about world conditions today and what the threats are today. The real issue is what capability you want for 2025 or 2030. The people who say you don't need this, they think the world is not gonna change in the next 20 years. And that is a hell of an assertion. By April 1991, bogged down by the F-15 debate, the U.S. Air Force prepares to announce the winner of the Advanced Tactical Fighter contract. But would the Raptor emerge from the controversy unscathed? On April 1st, 1991, the U.S. Air Force awarded a $9.5 billion contract to the Lockheed Boeing General Dynamics team responsible for the winning F-22 Raptor design. Having won the contract, Lockheed announced that it intended to locate the F-22's headquarters in Georgia, where the Raptor's forward fuselage would be built. General Dynamics will build the F-22's mid-body section in Fort Worth, Texas and Boeing would manufacture the wings and tail in Seattle, Washington. But just eight months after the contract was awarded, the program hit its first major snag. We lost one of the YF-22s. Fortunately, the test pilot, who was a good friend of mine then and now, walked away unharmed. During preliminary testing, the unthinkable happened. 
a YF-22 flown by Tom Morgenfeld crashed just after takeoff. As this unique footage shows, the aircraft's thrust vectoring system forces it to belly land on the runway. A key element of the Raptor's design, thrust vectoring uses movable exhaust nozzles to alter the angle of thrust from the two Pratt & Whitney engines. As the Raptor makes its low-level flyby, Tom Morgenfeld keeps the stick forward to keep the nose down. But as the landing gear is retracted, the thrust vectoring engages and pushes the aircraft towards the tarmac. As the pilot struggles to correct this change in direction, the Raptor seesaws. The fundamental error there had nothing to do with the airplane. It had to do with the fact that you don't fly a green airplane and fly it at low speeds, at low altitudes. The cause of that accident was stupidity on the part of the management. It had nothing to do with technology. Despite the loss of the stealth aircraft, the program had achieved its major goals. 10 million man-hours of analysis, 4,000 hours of radar testing, and hundreds of hours of flight testing had gone into the development of the aircraft, even before construction was given the go-ahead. In fact, the F-22 has accomplished more flight testing than any other fighter prior to full-scale production. The first F-A-22 built for the U.S. Air Force was unveiled in a ceremony on April the 9th, 1997, at the company's headquarters in Marietta, Georgia. Now, Air Force pilots would get the opportunity to check out the new aircraft for themselves. I would call the Raptor the Miss America of all aircraft. It's got the talent, it's got the bikini contest won, it's beautiful, it's got all the capabilities. It really wins the show in every aspect. The airplane is eye-watering. It, it does everything the pilot asks of it, and it is very good at what it does. First flown by the Air Force in 1997, Pilots at Edwards Air Force Base have surpassed 2,000 flight test hours in more than 900 missions. The first time I went out, one F-A-22, me, against four F-16s. And they told me what they were going to do. They were going to do everything possible to defeat my systems. And I watched exactly what they did the entire time and shot them all. It was almost too easy and I was almost laughing in the cockpit. One of the key advances in the Raptor's design is its advanced cockpit and integrated avionics systems. But I think really where the Raptor gets its amazing capability is the fusion of all of the different sensors on the aircraft. You have a tactical scope that combines the information of all the other sensors on the aircraft into one display for the pilot. So as a pilot, you don't have to sort through the radar or another sensor to see what's going on around you. Information is power, and the way this airplane displays information to you, it gives you knowledge of the battle space. It's all about uh, seeing what's out there in front of you and being able to make decisions about what to engage, when to engage, and how to engage it. I'd say integrated avionics does two things for me. Number one, it makes me a lot safer. Uh, it gives me less chance to crash my jet. It also makes every pilot who flies this aircraft more deadly. Uh, instead of having to do six or eight steps to achieve a kill, you really only have to do one. The Raptor carries a formidable array of ordnance. All of the Raptor's weapons are housed inside the aircraft. Two bays at the bottom of the plane utilize a pneumatic-style hydraulic launcher that literally punch the missiles, or JDAMs, out of the aircraft with a force of 40 Gs. And two side bays house air-to-air -air missiles. Here a trapeze launcher moves the missile outside the airframe very rapidly, a fraction of a second before the missile is fired. And to complement the Raptor's armament of eight missiles, the fighter also has a gun. 
At one point in the evolution of the advanced tactical fighter program, the US Air Force had raised the question of eliminating the gun to save weight. I think that the designers of the F-A-22 realized mistakes of the past, like the F-4 initially being designed without a gun, and realized that you should never say never about a threat that you're going to face or a situation you're going to find yourself in. And so the Raptor has designed itself a gun. Will anybody get close enough for us to use the gun? Well, hopefully not, probably not. By the late 90s, pilots in the Raptor program were convinced that their aircraft was made of the right stuff and would easily be able to outperform and destroy any other fighter in existence. It is the sum of the parts that makes the F-A-22 so capable. Probably most important in my eyes is the stealth. Having an aircraft that nobody can see is just a tremendous, tremendous advantage. The speed, the maneuverability, uh, the precision, all of those factors are incredible also. So when you put everything together, the Raptor is just incredible. But this belief was exclusively based on controlled flight and missile firing exercises. What the Raptor's pilots really needed was combat experience. And they were about to get it. Before the F-A-22 Raptor enters operational service with the US Air Force in the autumn of 2005, it will have completed thousands of hours of vigorous combat testing. But since Desert Storm, critics of the F-22 program claim that the F-15 Eagle, destined to be replaced by the Raptor, already has the attributes necessary to remain the world's preeminent air superiority fighter well into the new millennium. It is a view dismissed by the US Air Force. If you look at the F-15 and the F-18 and compare it with existing fighters that are sold around the world today, you'll find that today we're almost at parity. If we ever run up against an enemy that has the ability in terms of the air crew to use those enemy fighters, we will have a tough time with the current generation. The F-15 is a great aircraft and in air to air it is outstanding. However, with the production of new fighters that are being produced today and also some service to air threats, there are situations in the F-15 that would make me nervous. In March 2003, supporters of the F-15 got the opportunity to see whether or not the Eagle was still the best fighter in the sky. Five F-15s would go head-to-head -head with a single Raptor. Although no missiles would be used during the exercise, the sorties would closely resemble actual combat. No quarter would be given by either side. This was a kill or be killed exercise. There were five adversaries and, uh, and me, and uh, my biggest concern was running out of weapons uh, too soon. All five F-15s are flown by experienced F-22 pilots. One by one, the Raptor brings them down. I could never see them. I never knew that they were there, and I died. You got someone locked? Five points. Roll up. I could hear him on the radio calling his simulated missile shots, uh, Fox 2, uh, and uh, knowing that uh, this was getting really unnerving, because I could also tell his range was was closing rapidly on me. I don't think anybody ever saw me the entire time that uh, while we were out in the airspace. Bandit, bandit. Fox. Fox. Could not find him no matter what I did, and the next time was when he flew directly over the top of my airplane. I saw him visually. Well, in three, two, one, snap. I know firsthand from flying the Raptor against other aircraft and flying other aircraft against the Raptor that it's like clubbing baby seals. It's so easy. The first indication you have that an F-A-22 is out in your uh, area of responsibility is when you are in your parachute uh, heading down towards Earth and your, your jet is falling a little bit faster than you are. 
In combat testing with F-15s, the F-A-22 Raptor has emphatically proven its doubters wrong. There have been times when the Raptor has gone up two versus eight against F-15s, and it ends up being boring for the adversaries because no matter what they do, they die. Having flown the F-15 and now having flown the Raptor and seen combat, I would not want to be on the receiving end of what the F-A-22 is capable of. We will take on anything, any combination of the latest, uh, the latest aircraft that we can throw at ourselves, and we usually win. To date, 27 F-A-22 Raptors have been delivered to the U.S. Air Force and are in limited operation at Edwards, Nellis and Tyndall Air Force bases. Many more will follow. The Air Force has agreed to a final production run of almost 300 aircraft. I think 300 F-A-22s will tip the scales of any conflict in our favor. I think that any country who sees 300 F-A-22s uh, flying towards it has got to get a little nervous. Lockheed expects that a full production rate of 60 aircraft per year will have been achieved by the end of 2004. And with components and parts coming from 46 congressional states, the F-A-22 is truly a national effort. Costing a massive $93 million each, the Raptor is certainly the world's most expensive fighter aircraft, but for many, it is money well spent. Yeah, this is something special. This was not like an F-15 on steroids or an F-16 on steroids. This was the real thing with a leap of technology that's orders of magnitude better than what we have now. The interesting thing about the F-22, though, is it is a fixed volume with an infinitely increasing ability in terms of its computer capabilities. If you think about the airplane, it has fixed holes in the sides of the fuselage where computers sit today. In the future, there will be more computer capacity that requires less power going in that same physical hole. So the F-A-22 over the course of its life will only become a more and more flexible and more and more potent machine as computer capacity increases. America's F-A-22 Raptor was created out of the Cold War fear that Russian-made fighters would sweep aside the F-15. But the world has changed since the frigid days of the Cold War. The Soviet Union no longer exists, and the F-15 has more than earned the fear and respect it commands as the current frontline fighter for the U.S. Air Force. But the Raptor, Lockheed's F-A-22, looks all set to carry U.S. Air Force doctrine well into the 21st century. I'd be terrified to, uh, to go into the arena with something like that. I really would. I've been on the receiving end of it in testing and, uh, and mentally translated myself to what if this was combat. And it is a unnerving and a, a disquieting feeling to fly in the same airspace with one of these airplanes. I would say that it's not fair to our enemies or even our own technology to fight against the Raptor. But the goal of war isn't fair, that we don't go into combat because we want a fair fight. We want to win as fast as possible with as little loss of life as possible. And the Raptor allows that to do that for generations to come. In today's changing world, there are few certainties. But the rule of the Raptor, America's air dominance fighter, over the skies, is one of them.